Welcome to our reflections on the book of Revelation. I want to continue with introducing the book to make sure that we actually know what direction we're actually going in. The book is written by the church, to the church, and for the church. If you remember that, we have the whole thing. There are some Christians who want to say that after chapter three, the book of Revelation no longer deals with the church. I have no idea how they can come to that particular conclusion. It's written to the church by a bishop of the church, obviously writing to his own diocese. And so the church is the seven churches of Asia in chapters two and three. And they are told exactly what their problems are and what they must do about it uh, and what is coming and why it is that they must change rather quickly which is extremely important for us because I will show you when we're doing chapters two and three that the problems that were in those churches are in the church today. And so uh, in the end times, it is extremely urgent for us to, to pick up the message that is there. So it's written for the church as she journeys through the wilderness of history to the wind up of history in the end times. And we are going to see that the terminus of her journey is first of all in chapter 19 she comes to the wedding of the lamb when she's ready then there's the return of christ and there's the new era of peace and holiness and that is uh, john calls it the new jerusalem so the church has to get ready for the return of jesus his parousia uh, his final return and he is coming to claim his bride and to claim his territory. He, he left the earth as the Lamb of God. He's going to return as the Lion of Judah. So we're going to see this change over from lamb into lion uh, in the, the book. So when the lion is making his territory clear to everybody else, he takes action. And we're going to see Jesus taking real action when it comes to the seals and the trumpets and the, the bowls. Church is told at the very beginning, in chapters two and three, that she needs to be purified. And we know from reading church history that the church has needed to be purified all the time, absolutely continuously, just as we human beings need to purify, i.e. wash our bodies every day. And in the same way, our souls need to be washed in the precious blood of the Lamb in the sacraments that the Lord has provided for us. Jesus gave a parable about the end times in Matthew 25. Uh, and that is the wise and foolish virgins waiting for the bridegroom to return. And only 50% of them were actually ready. Uh, that's a, a very interesting uh, number that's given by uh, Matthew. And in Luke 12, from verse 35 to 40, Jesus said that his, his disciples and his servants needed to be ready when he returned. So this get ready now is a very important message in the book of Revelation. And if you're listening to the Lord speaking to his servants today, the message is even more urgent. Get ready, the time is now. I'm coming now. The now means that there aren't more centuries that you can push it out into, the time is for us. The other thing that John wants to deal with, and that is that Jesus told us in Luke 12, verses four to five, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of them. Only be afraid of him who could consign your soul to hell. And so John's going to pick that up and tell the early Christians that persecution isn't the problem. Your relationship with God is, where are you going? Are you going to try and save your life or are you going to risk losing your physical life to save your soul? That's going to be the issue. And so uh, the church must also obey Jesus, uh, as he said in Luke 12, 56, that we must actually read the signs of the times, that we may, must be able to interpret uh, what God is actually saying in our own era. And from the very beginning of the church, false teachers and heresies showed their ugly faces. And you can see that from the letters of St. Paul and St. John and James and Peter, that they are dealing with false prophets and as Paul also says, false apostles, that is leaders. 
in the church as well. And so they have to remember what Jesus warned us about in Luke chapter 12, verse 2. And that is that there's nothing concealed that won't be revealed. And that's all the, the mystery is going to be uncovered, unveiled, revealed to us in the apocalypse, which means, of course, as I said before, an unveiling. So what John wants to give us, therefore, is an understanding of the hidden mystery of history. History is not just uh, some kind of arbitrary thing uh, which has neither beginning nor ending or meaning, uh, that there, there is a meaning to it. And so in this book, John is going to answer the question, why does God allow chastisements to come to the earth? Why does the church have such a hard time in her journey uh, through history? Where is it all going to? Is there any meaning to these events? And is Jesus really going to come back? I mean, really? It's not just teaching. It's not just doctrine. Is he really coming back? And if so, when is he coming back? And how is he coming back? Now, we know from the Acts of the Apostles in the Ascension uh, that the angels told the church that Jesus will return in the same way as you've seen him go. Well, he left in victory, power and glory, and he will return in victory, power and glory. The next thing I want to give you as an introduction is something that is unique to John. Uh, John uh, uses numbers in a very significant way. Uh, they all have meaning and the number he prefers, and you know this if you've studied his gospel, his favourite number is seven, the number of perfection and completeness. So in the book of Revelation, John gives us seven Beatitudes scattered throughout the whole book. And it begins in chapter 1 and verse 2. Blessed are those who read this prophecy, even if you read it without understanding. Blessed are those who listen to him who reads it for you. And you are blessed if you treasure all that it says, because the end time is close. So notice, if you read the prophecy or listen to somebody else, as you are listening to me now, but you've got to treasure it in your heart as our Blessed Mother did and we're told in Luke chapter 2 that she treasured uh, everything that God said and did pertaining to her in her heart and we have to do the same thing as well. So the second beatitude is in chapter 14 and verse 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. If you die in the Lord, you're going to hear in chapter 20 about the first resurrection and, and you're safe, you're in the kingdom of God. In chapter 16 and verse 15, we have a, a, a very interesting warning given to us. Uh, Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes on. If you read that literally, you're in trouble. So that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now, what does it mean, keep your clothes on? John is not talking about people running around naked physically. He's not talking about that. Your clothes are your baptismal robe that was given to you when you entered the kingdom of God. And if you rebel against God's will and deliberately sin and live like the world, in the world, uh, as bad as the world, you're naked spiritually. And you're going to hear Laodicea being told that she is naked. That's very important. So nakedness means without your baptismal garment protecting you, without grace, and therefore you're exposed to all the evil that's in the world. And that is to be shamefully exposed. So Laodicea is going to be told that her sin is shameful. And John tells us that in the third wave of the tribulation, when things are really terminal. And then we come to chapter 19 for the fourth one. Uh, and this is the chapter that gives us the glorious return of Christ. Uh, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. In other words, all those Christians who have allowed God to purify them and make them ready for this wonderful communion with the Lord. And he says uh, in uh, 
1909, he added, these are the true words of God. That's why the church has always used that expression just before Holy Communion. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Okay, so in chapter 20, uh, verse 6, blessed and holy are those who take part in the first resurrection. Now, if you've kept your clothes on in chapter 6 and you've been invited to the wedding in chapter uh, 19, yes, you will be part of the first resurrection and all the martyrs who have given their lives are part of the first resurrection as well. The second death, which is hell, uh, has no power over them and they will be the priests of God, that is those serving God directly. They will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, Psalm 90 verse 3 says that with the Lord a thousand years is like a single day. So it's the day of the Lord. Chapter 22 verse 7, uh, Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That means you keep them in your heart and you let this word actually help you to make the decisions that need to be made. And finally, in chapter 22 and verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes clean so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates of the city. So this is a surprising beatitude in the last chapter of the book of Revelation because we would think it's all over. And so what John says is, if you have washed your robes white in the blood of the Lamb, you have availed of the sacrament of reconciliation. You have allowed Jesus to wash you clean from your sins. Then you have received the right to uh, eat from the tree of life, which you will hear Jesus saying to the churches as well. And you may go through the city. That's the very important thing. You may enter the new era of peace and holiness and live in the will of God. So now what I want to do in the time uh, left in this session is that I want to give you a summary of the book of Revelation. And I have made it out in a chart so that you can actually follow it because if you have a summary of the book of Revelation what you will find is that you will keep things in perspective. I know people who go to the book of Revelation looking for the mark of the beast that's totally out of perspective. We need the perspective and I want you to watch because I'm going to write in the air as I usually do when I'm on television. Chapter 1 begins with the vision of heaven. That's very, very, very important. And in this vision of heaven, uh, John sees Christ in glory and how his victory and his glory is going to affect the church on earth. Okay, I'm going to use my left hand now. That's a vision of heaven. In chapters 2 and 3, we come right down to earth. And Christ in glory is in the heart of the church and has the church absolutely in his hands and he tells the church I know all about you and he tells them their sins, their struggles, their difficulties and everything they do right and he's guiding the church. So we go from this heavenly vision to uh, what's going on in the church. Then in chapters 4 and 5 John takes you back up to heaven again. I want you to notice it begins in heaven, goes down to the earth, back up to heaven. And in chapters 4 and 5, we have the central vision of the entire book. John never loses its perspective. It's terribly important. Okay. And there we meet God's throne, and we meet the heavenly liturgy, and we meet the Lamb, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And the most amazing thing is, if you're Catholic, you will recognize chapters 4 and 5. It, the vision doesn't stop there. The vision goes right through to the very end. You will see the church's liturgy with the presence of God and the sanctuary and the priests on the sanctuary, the word of God proclaimed, the prayers of the people, the sanctus, and uh, blessed are those uh, invited to the supper of the Lamb, 
the lamb comes on the altar at the consecration and then we are invited afterwards and so on. You'll see it there. It's right in the very heart of the book of Revelation. So if you keep this vision of God's throne and what is going on at God's throne, if you keep that in mind, then you'll have the right perspective to come down to the earth again in chapter 6. And in chapter 6, you meet the first stage of the tribulation. But it's only from the position of the mountain that this tribulation actually makes sense. If you go back to the time of Moses, uh, when Moses had spent 40 uh, days on the mountain, came down and saw the sins of the people, he agreed to a tribulation. He was the very one who actually instigated the purification of the people and the chastisement of the people. So uh, we have to keep this perspective of the throne of God in order to understand the chastisement that happens on the earth in chapter 6. Now, the happenings in chapter 6 sound so terminal, if you read them literally, that it finishes with, well, who can survive this? And John brings you right back up into heaven and he says, these people survive. I'll show you how to survive. Even if they kill the body, you still win. This is a win-win situation. And so we have a, a vision of the saints in glory. And we're, bringing, we're brought right back up to that, chapters 4 and 5. We're seeing the congregation uh, in glory. Okay. And once we've seen, yes, the saints are taken to their destiny, their home in heaven, come up here, the Lord says, Okay, uh, once you see that, then you will understand that we come right back to earth again in chapters eight and nine for the second wave of the tribulation because there needs to be more souls saved. And the tribulation will do more than anything else to try and bring people through an experience of suffering, through an experience of difficulty, to bring them to God and to save their souls. So we have this second wave of the tribulation. The first wave was called the seals, the second wave is called the trumpets. I, I prefer to call them the waves. Okay. And then we go from chapters 8 and 9 to an intermediate period, an interlude in chapters 10 and 11, which is neither heaven nor earth, because it's earth living in communion with heaven. So it's heaven on earth. It's the church living, it's proper life on earth. And there we meet the, the responsibility of the church to intercede for the world. We meet the two great witnesses and the wonderful ministry that they have uh, before the nations and all the rest of it. So there you have the first half. Begin in heaven, then you come down and see what's wrong in the church, then you go back to heaven see what's going on in heaven, where the real power is, where the real reign is, and then you realize that the earth needs to be purified. You look at the purification of the earth, go back up to heaven, see how things are going on in heaven, come back, see the church living heaven on earth in chapters 10 and 11. So now we come into the second half of the book of Revelation, and the first thing you meet with is a glorious woman. And I'll say more about this uh, at a later a stage. Uh, and here you have the image of the church as she should be, the glorious woman. And she's full of grace. She has the 12 apostles uh, as the stars in her crown. But wherever the woman is, the dragon is as well. And so John in this image is trying to help us to understand that Satan is trying to wipe out the church from the very beginning. And so there's no way the church can avoid struggle, pain, persecution, death and martyrdom. There's no way unless she becomes very worldly like Laodicea and dead. There's no way. And so the thing that is illustrated in chapter 12 is that the church must carry the cross. The body must be similar to the head. It's not just the head that was to take the cross and redeem the world. He has a body that must actually participate as well. We have to be like him because the whole Christ 
is the head and the body together. And so chapter 12 helps us to understand the huge struggle of the church and why she cannot get away from the cross. But her salvation is to go into the wilderness and to be in prayer before God. Now, the amazing thing is that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Christians in the early church took that cue and went out into the desert and actually became monks all over Egypt and Syria and uh, the, the whole of the Middle East. Thank you for listening. Sloan August Bannock, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.